Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Hello and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB, and joining me tonight to explore children's health matters is Marvin McGraw. Marvin is a former broadcast journalist who works for the Division of Administration and handled PR for LSU Health following Hurricane Katrina. Thank you, Beth. Uh, great to be here. That was hectic but rewarding, being able to highlight the rebuilding of healthcare in New Orleans. And we're hoping to do something equally important tonight, focus on the challenges to children's health, provide answers, and promote LPB's efforts to improve outcomes for Louisiana's families. Well, Marvin, in January, LPB will be launching a new series called One to Grow On, featuring tips for parents, grandparents, sitters, teachers, and friends to help Louisiana children thrive. Well, Louisiana currently ranks 48th for its children's overall well-being due to issues like low birth weight babies, obese children, and accidental deaths. The pandemic has also caused an uptick in stress. Over the next hour, we'll be addressing prenatal concerns, children's wellness, safety, and mental health. During the broadcast, we encourage viewers to join an interactive survey on these topics. Text HEALTH to 415-223-8013 or visit lpb.org slash children's health. We start our discussion where all children's health begins at pregnancy. Bringing a child to term in Louisiana can be a significant risk for some mothers. About 700 women die of pregnancy-related problems every year in the U.S. That's a rate of 17 deaths per 100,000 live births. But in Louisiana, the rate is 45, more than double the national average. The leading cause is homicide, especially among younger women. Doctors can connect mothers with violence prevention services, but many Louisiana women don't have easy access to maternal care. 22 parishes lack hospitals that offer obstetric care, or OBGYNs. Without regular prenatal care, women put themselves and their children at greater health risk. The One to Grow On series includes spots targeting expectant mothers. You just found out you're pregnant, and on top of all those emotions, you think, now what? Well, the first step is to make sure you find a qualified healthcare provider who will help you prepare for a smooth pregnancy and delivery, and to be able to answer any and all questions you may have. When doctors see expecting mothers regularly, they can detect and treat any potential health problems, so don't wait. Babies of mothers who don't get prenatal care are three times more likely to have a low birth weight and five times more likely to die in childbirth. Participating in prenatal care is so important. Don't let a lack of health insurance deter you. Visit onetogrowon.org slash prenatal care to help you find the right care. And joining me in the studio to discuss prenatal and infant care is Dr. Terry Thomas, a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist with Women's Hospital. She currently serves as the secretary of the Louisiana State Board of Medical Examiners. And joining us remotely is Dr. Lauren Bailey, a pediatrician with Our Lady of the Lake Children's Health in Lafayette. Dr. Thomas, first questions for you. Um, we just heard that the death rate for pregnant women in Louisiana is twice the national average with homicide being the leading cause. Um, is connecting with the a physician early in pregnancy, can that make a difference? Good morning, Marvin. Uh, that's a very appropriate question. So, you know, about one in three women have experienced rape, domestic violence, or even um, stalking by their intimate partners. Um, and then when we look at homicides, um, definitely, um, you know, 
homicides account for the the leading cause for death among um, pregnant women, which is astounding. Um, and unfortunately, this is another area in medicine where African American women are disproportionately affected. So in 2018, about 63 percent of those homicides were in women of color. So it's definitely um, a topic that needs to be addressed. Um, one of the things that um, prenatal care is meant to do is to address modifiable risk mm -hmm. factors. And I certainly feel like violence against women is something that um, is modifiable. So one of the things that we um, have in my office is we have a system for asking the important questions. So at the very first prenatal visit, we um, ask every single patient in a standardized fashion, and our medical assistants are trained to do so in a very um, safe environment. Um, so we ask those questions, we ask them in a safe way and in a non-intimidating way, and we ask the questions again and again. So we have a standard set of times during prenatal care where we consistently monitor those patients and screen them for domestic violence, and then other things that, can, um, that we can work on to improve. And then the third part of that is that we have a system for referral. So we have a social worker that um, is in our office five days a week, we also have a grief uh, recovery counselor that's in our office. So I think the three key components to, um, to addressing this, um, this very unfortunate part of society is that number one, you have to ask the questions. Number two, um, you have to ask the questions in a non-intimidating way and create a safe haven for patients. And number three, you have to be ready to intervene so that you can make a change and improve the lives of your patients. Interesting. So what other benefits could a, a physician provide uh, during pregnancy? And, and what about the women who may live in areas that don't have many OBGYNs? Excellent question. So, you know, prenatal care is a concept that's been around for over the last 100 years, and um, it has definitely made some great um, improvements in the health of, of women across the United States and certainly in Louisiana. But we have a long way to go. There are still some some pretty important issues and some poor outcomes that we really need to work on. So, some of the things that we really try to target in terms of prenatal care um, are those modifiable risk factors. Smoking is a huge one here in Louisiana, unfortunately. So, you know, at that very first visit, we are talking to the patient about decreasing smoking and not necessarily in a punitive fashion, but we are, you know, asking the patient, what are your challenges? You know, what leads you to smoking? What creates that environment that makes you want to choose that as an option for you? Um, we are also working on some, unfortunately, some chronic health issues like chronic hypertension and diabetes. So, you know, I think for me, the important part of prenatal care is the pre. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, you know, come to us when they get that positive pregnancy test. Right. But for me and for so many other physicians, prenatal care starts basically in childhood good education, good health care, good nutrition, good access to care. Those are all the things that lead up to those maternal years when, you know, we as physicians are faced with some very serious chronic health conditions that really need to be addressed before that first positive pregnancy test. So, um, so smoking, chronic hypertension, and then um, definitely obesity. We have got to get a hold of that in, in this country. And it's not um, it's not just left up to the healthcare providers. We need to be teaching our kids in school. We need to be promoting, you know, um, healthy eating. It's not just, um, you know, a part of the healthcare system. It's a part of our whole society where we really have to think about improving the health of all Americans. Very good. Uh, Dr. Bailey, uh, welcome to the show. We know that there are certain things that women should avoid during pregnancy. Um, we just heard uh, Dr. Thomas say, why is it uh, it's risky to smoke or drink during pregnancy? Uh, are there some foods that uh, perhaps pregnant women should avoid? Uh, and are there some supplements that they should be taking uh, during pregnancy? Hey, Marvin, thank you so much for having me and let me come on via Zoom. Um, Yes, there's definitely some things that, you know, we should definitely watch for while we're pregnant. 
things that can harm a baby and mama the same. Um, things like, you know, lunch meat, um, there is a higher chance for listeria infections, which can um, end up terminating the fetus. So things like cold lunch meat, you have to cook those. Things like soft cheeses, so a lot of people like feta cheese, that is no longer good for us in pregnancy. Also things like raw fish, like sushi, and then um, other certain fishes that are um, a little bit higher in mercury can also be damaging to the baby. So things like swordfish, uh, sharks, if you eat those kind of things. So you have to kind of watch, even some tunas can be higher in mercury. Um, so there's usually a lot of lists that you can look at and kind of um, reference when you're pregnant to make sure that you're not doing anything that can harm the baby. The other thing is, you know, prenatal vitamins. We pretty much recommend anybody that is childbearing age to start a multivitamin, particularly folic acid. It's one of those vitamins that's essential for um, neural tubes, which is what ends up developing into the spinal cord. Um, unfortunately for us, babies develop a lot of their major organs and uh, body parts a lot of times before you even know we're pregnant. And so if you're not, um, resilient and cognizant of those things and aren't taking those vitamins before you find out that you're pregnant, there is a potential that you've already damaged the baby before you even knew it. So what are some of the benefits of waiting until 39 weeks to deliver? Oh, there's so many. Um, really, the main thing is lung maturity. You know, we typically call um, 37 weeks and above truly pre uh, excuse me, full term. Um, but really every child is variable. So by waiting till 39 weeks, you have a higher chance of full lung maturity, which will help the baby as they transition from mother providing all their oxygen to them having to um, use their young lungs and um, be able to breathe on their own. The other thing is um, they're gonna be higher weights. So there's gonna be less chance for low blood sugars. Um, they're going to be able to have more of a temperature stability on their own by being more full term, um, as well as just being able to keep their heart rates up and their respiratory rates up on their own without any kind of drops that we often see and have to end up being, sending babies over to the NICU for. Very good. Uh, Dr. Thomas, we heard that uh, Louisiana is above average in terms of low weight babies. Uh, what can we do to reduce this number? Excellent question. So um, low birth weight infants are defined as those infants that weigh approximately less than about five and a half uh, pounds at birth. And um, unfortunately, about 8% um, of the babies born in Louisiana um, as of 2018 fit under that category. So again, going back to good, solid prenatal care and overall health and nutrition. So um, one of the biggest things is smoking. So smoking mm -hmm. definitely decreases um, uh, birth weight for infants. Um, and then there are some chronic conditions like high blood pressure and diabetes. So having excellent care, taking your blood pressure medication on a regular basis, exercising, eating right, taking really good care of your diabetes before you get pregnant. Those are essential things. Um, and then of course, um, you know, high blood pressure is a risk factor for something that we are really battling these days, which is preeclampsia. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some um, risk factors that have nothing to do with your health status, like being African American and being a first time mom. Those are independent risk factors for preeclampsia. But Poorly controlled diabetes, poorly controlled high blood pressure, those are also risk factors for the development of preeclampsia. So, um, and preeclampsia can lead to um, low birth weight infants and even very low birth weight infants. So sometimes we purposefully have to deliver those moms, you know, well before 39 weeks, sometimes at 28 or 30 weeks. And so those are babies that end up going to the um, NICU. Um, so, Again, it's all about um, addressing those modifiable risk factors. Very good. Uh, Dr. Bailey, um, if you're a new mom, you know to call the doctor if your baby has a fever, but what are some of the other symptoms that should trigger an alarm? So certainly, you know, fever. So we consider fever anything above 100.4, but also with babies, they can actually have low um, temperatures when they're sick. So. You know, I usually say 97.5 or below, you should probably also go to the emergency room. Other things like poor feeding, 
where they're um, more inconsolable, where they're just crying, 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 and there is nothing you can do to soothe them, as well as, you know, babies that are extra sleepy, not being able to be easily awakened, all can be signs that a baby can have um, a serious life-threatening condition like an infection or something like that. Um, the other thing is that if a baby is just refusing to eat and they're having decreased wet diapers, not stooling well, um, or even you know, early on, right after you come home from the hospital, even something like you thinking that their skin looks a little bit more yellow can be an indication that they might have jaundice, which if it gets too um, high can actually cause some significant um, neurological uh, issues and cause them to have more of like a cerebral palsy type of picture going forward. Well, I, I wanna thank you both, Dr. Thomas and Dr. Bailey for those tips for Louisiana's pregnant women and new mothers. Once a child has arrived, there are a number of health and wellness issues to consider. We spoke with Teresa Falgu, the Kids Count Program Coordinator with Agenda for Children about some of those and where the state needs improvement. A Kids Count is an effort funded by the Annie Casey Foundation to provide legislators, public officials, and child advocates with reliable data policy recommendations and tools to make better policies for kids and family. And so one of the things that we do is we help support the National Kids Count um, group, put out the National Kids Count data book each year, which ranks every state on overall child well-being. Louisiana is currently ranked 48. And we also produce local level data as well. Obesity and overweight is one of Kids Count's newest indicators, and it shows that 35% of Louisiana children ages 10 to 17 are either considered overweight or obese in Louisiana, which ranked us 42nd on that measure. So we know that regardless of a child's weight, there's a lot of things that we can do to ensure that kids reach their optimal health. And so that includes things like ensuring that they've got lots of extended time for unstructured play, like recess, and that they've got lots of opportunities for things like PE classes, intramural sports, which we know often kind of go by the wayside, unfortunately, with the pressure on testing. We also need to look at our physical infrastructure and communities. Are neighborhoods safe enough for kids to walk to and from school? Are there sidewalks? And we can also do a lot to make food more affordable and accessible for families. One of the things that we've seen with COVID-19 is that Louisiana's children really previously already faced so many challenges. They're more likely to live in poverty. They're more likely to have poor health outcomes. And we've really seen in many ways that these challenges are just being magnified and accelerated with the pandemic. And joining us to discuss some of the challenges to children's health and wellness is Dr. Katie Queen, a pediatrician whose focus is on obesity. She practices at Our Lady of the Angels Hospital in Bogalusa, part of the Lady of the Lake Children's Health Network. And Dr. Chelsea Crock, who researches pediatric obesity for the Pennington Biomedical Research Center in Baton Rouge. And Dr. Queen, uh, thank you for being here. Let's start with you. Um, in terms of childhood nutrition, a lot has changed over the years. Uh, we all remember the food pyramid, but that uh, has changed too in relation to kids' nutrition. Yeah, actually it's been about 10 years since they changed the pyramid, but now what the USDA is recommending is that when you feed your children breakfast, lunch, or dinner, that you make what's called my plate. It's um, basically you serve your child the plate and you imagine a line down the middle and you want to put half of the plate fruits and vegetables, which a lot of kids don't like fruits and vegetables. Um, my kids in particular, I kind of load it up more on fruits, but they like cut up tomatoes, carrots. It doesn't have to be cooked spinach. It doesn't have to be kale. It doesn't have to be fancy. They like finger foods. So that's half of your plate, fruits and vegetables. And that's going to help your kids to feel full. It's going to have lots of vitamins. The more colors, the more vitamins. Then in the other corner, if you can imagine my plate here, that corner is going to have protein, particularly beans, nuts, low fat uh, dairy, um, so low fat cheese, low fat yogurt, and then lean meat. So particularly fish, poultry, turkey, and then pork, if you look for the word loin, will be healthier. So that protein, when you put that on your child's plate, that helps their muscles grow and that helps them feel full so they're not 
asking you for, for snacks in an hour. And then the last corner, that's this is the most important. We only want to have one corner of the plate to be a grain. So grain means carbohydrates, it means starches. We want to keep it to the corner or about the size of your child's hand um, because too much of that can lead to high sugar, can lead to diabetes and heart disease and all kinds of problems. Uh, a rule of thumb for your grains is you want to choose whole grains. So when you go to the store, you want to look on the label or you want it to say whole. Um, that's healthier, it's going to have more fiber, going to keep the kids full. Now, what if your kids just finish their plate and they're like, I want more, I want more, which my kids do this. Right. I say, there's sure. a rule. This is a rule for my patients and my kids, 20 minutes. You got to wait 20 minutes. It literally takes 20 minutes for your stomach to talk to your brain and then say, go play. When you come back, if you want more, you can have more fruits, more vegetables, more protein, but no more grains until the next meal. Um, and if you want to learn more, choosemyplate.gov is a great resource, has lots of visuals and stuff for your family. Choosemyplate.gov. Yes. Very good. Well, I know in today's lifestyle it can be tough to do, but what are some of the benefits of eating together as a family? A lot. I think everybody knows that that's a good thing, but everybody's gotten away from it just with the chaos of social media and television and taking your kids to karate and gymnastics. I mean, I, I'm guilty of it too. But studies have shown that when you eat together with your family, um, the benefits are enormous including a better family relationships, um, better communication with your kids. They're more likely to tell you things mm. that are happening at school with their friends. Um, better grades has been linked in some of the studies um, and healthier food choices when you're sitting down. So one of the things I recommend is just start small. Two days a week, 20 minutes. It doesn't have to be a long drawn out meal, 20 minutes, put your screens away, put your phones away, check them in. My kids take our phones and say, no phones, mama. And um, play a game. If you have young kids, we play a game called praise or prayer. We go around and, and give praise to one of the other family members or say a prayer, or we say best, um, best part of the day, worst part of the day. And that's fun for my kids. <laughs> Older kids, um, you can just make up something that they wanna talk about, or you can talk about your day. So I do highly recommend family meals. Dr. Yeah. Crock, uh, turning to you, what does your research show with regards to exercise? How much should children uh, get, uh, especially before they enter school? Yes, well, thank you for having me. Well, for exercise, this actually starts when, we, when we're born. So even though there's no official recommendation, we mm -hmm. do want to promote tummy time, which is time spent in our stomach, and also reduce the amount of time our children are spent in, uh, for instance, carriers or strollers for more than 30 minutes restrained. Now, once we, uh, I guess, age up to two or three, the recommendations from the CDC and the physical activity guidelines are three hours a day of physical activity and one hour of that to be moderate and vigorous. Now, for us who have small children, we'd say most children uh, are pretty active and reach that three hours. And I think for most of us, not, the studies would also show that as well. Where we really need to focus is moderate to vigorous physical activity. What we have shown in our studies at Pennington is that meeting the moderate to vigorous physical activity guideline and being active or very active is associated with fundamental motor skills later on. And fundamental motor skills are very important. This is the ability to kick, to hop, and jump, not only for bone health, but also for some of that academic development later on. And so when we think about activities, we want to make sure that family is involved, as mentioned by uh, Dr. McQueen, so that we can promote that moderate to vigorous physical activity and meet the guideline. So what can, uh, what can families do to make sure that their children get the proper amount of exercise? Well, families are very important. So not only the parents, but also siblings. So when we think about families involving, we, we don't have to overthink it here. The first step could be just to uh, go out for a walk that could promote that light physical activity. And part of being outdoors is also um, associated with mental health. So we can just first take that first step literally out the door and just walk down the, the block. Also where families can promote is also just modeling physical activity themselves. So parents themselves can engage in physical activity and show their children how important it is. Now, since most families have multiple kids and at this time, we're probably spending a little more time at home. I'd try to find opportunities for kids to be involved with each other. So that includes some of those fundamental moral skills of uh, kicking, hopping, and jumping, but really just working together and figuring out a way that we can all enjoy being active together and reducing that time spent sitting. Very good. Uh, Dr. Queen, growing up, I know my, my children love soft drinks. What are some, which is not so good, right? <laughs> um, so what are some non-sugary options? And what is, tell me about some of the things that the lake is doing to combat obesity. Children. Sure. So I think that we've come a long way. I think most people realize that sodas are not the healthiest option mm -hmm. for your kids. Um, so sodas and energy drinks are the number one cause, number one source of added sugar in the American diet. Um, energy drinks is big for teenagers. Um, so just one 
can, like a 12 ounce can can have 10 teaspoons of added sugar. So imagine, would you feed your, your daughter you know, 10 teaspoons of sugar? It sounds disgusting. Um, so what should you give them instead? Water, obviously, is the healthiest. A lot of kids do not like water. They didn't necessarily grow up drinking water. Um, you can start water at six months of age, and you can add a little bit of flavor, like I like to squeeze a little lemon in my water. If your kids just do not like water, you can flavor it with some of the like crystal lights and the things like Mio, but my caveat to that is that is okay as a bridge as you're trying to get them off of the sugar sweetened beverages. But there are some studies that suggest it can increase appetite. It actually can increase craving of sugar. So that's not a long-term solution, um, but it is a way to get them off of the sugar sweetened beverages. Um, you asked the second question, Our Lady of the Lake, children's health. We have some really exciting things that are going on right now. In particular, we are joining up with Pennington on a study um, called Team Up, and it is going to improve improve care for children with obesity at 10 of our clinics in Baton Rouge, including my clinic in, in Bogalusa. And we are going to be linking children with obesity to dietitians, to behavioral health coaches, and we're studying an intensive behavioral um, treatment to see if that helps kids. And the second thing is in March, we are planning a very big symposium with some expert speakers for pediatricians, healthcare providers around the state to learn about the best evidence-based treatment for obesity. And there are some other exciting things I can't tell you about yet, but okay. we have a lot of things going on. Excellent, uh, looking forward to it. So Dr. Kroc, uh, uh, children like adults, I mean, they can get addicted to digital media and this can lead to a obesity. I mean, it's, it's a real problem. Um, what can parents do to limit their child's uh, screen time? Well, I think the, the first thing to look at is first parents, and as mentioned before, parents are very important for physical activity, but also screen time. So look at our own screen time habits. How are we using it? And how it's also being incorporated into the home. So is the routine that we go and sit down and watch TV and really thinking about how we can kind of create a routine that might facilitate physical activity rather than sitting and watching TV. Now, in this day and age, we know uh, screen time is going to be there, though. Um, and so if we are going to be watching screens, let's focus on it being educational, involved, and if make sure we're not sitting for too long, so taking some breaks. Um, if we are gonna be watching the screens, we wanna make sure we're involved with the entire family and also involved in with what's being shown. Um, as mentioned before, we do have that study called Team Up that is focusing on working with families who have uh, overweight and promoting family habits that can potentially reduce screen time and help uh, families be healthy. Hey, Dr. Queen, uh, how, how do we know when it's uh, your infant is ready to transition from baby food to regular food? So in particular, from formula to baby food mm -hmm. is a is a transition that a lot of parents have questions about usually around six months of age if they're not premature they start to be able to hold their head up they can hold their neck up and they start to look at you while you're eating you know showing that they want to taste something so you can start with pureed foods there is a move towards First foods can be anything. It doesn't have to be fruits or vegetables. It can be meats, pureed. It can be grains. Um, you, as long as it's pureed, it's not something they can choke on. You want to give a variety. You want to let, let them taste sour and sweet and salty and avocado and different things like that. And you want to talk to your pediatrician to make sure that they are ready. Some studies do show that if we introduce food too early before six months, it may lead to higher rates of obesity. So that's why we do recommend around six months is the time to start. So. Uh uh, one final question, how important are vaccinations? And what do you say to moms who may be reluctant uh, to have their child get one? So vaccinations are one of the, the best ways that you can prevent illness in your children. So you can prevent illness, but not only that, you can actually prevent death. Um, I think people have gotten very complacent, especially after COVID, people are scared to go to their pediatrician. And the studies are showing that our vaccination rates in Louisiana have been declining. So it's very, very important to to call your pediatrician and to go get your vaccinations, in particular the flu shot. Um, it is the best way that you can prevent illness. And I also recommend if you have questions about it, just talk to your mm -hmm. pediatrician. I'm a mom, I understand there's a lot of scary things out there in the news, but get your, your information from reputable sources like the CDC, from AAP, they have um, healthychildren.org has a lot of um, information on vaccinations. I do highly support vaccinations. Well, thank you both. Uh, thanks Dr. Queen and Dr. Kroc for sharing that information on health and wellness for Louisiana's children. As children grow, there'll be falls, and many of these accidents teach children the limits of their developing bodies. But some accidents can be dangerous. Half of childhood deaths in Louisiana are due to injuries that could have been prevented. 
Renee Gilbo with Children's Hospital of New Orleans spoke with us about the most common avoidable injuries. In Louisiana, for infants under the age of one, suffocation is truly the leading cause of death. Nine in 10 children in Louisiana, so that's 88% of deaths that happen for children under the age of one in Louisiana is due to suffocation. So if you put a baby in a crib, it shouldn't have pillows and stuffed animals and bumpers and a lot of cloth items where kids can get trapped in and not be able to breathe. Or sleeping, I know a lot of parents, it's really hard, they get tired, they fall asleep with the baby on their chest on the sofa and you know may roll over um, and a baby can't breathe in that situation. And so it really is just about creating a very safe sleep space for your baby. With children over the age of one, motor vehicle crashes, um, drownings and fire are some of the leading causes of death and injury. It doesn't take a whole lot to fill up, particularly a baby's lungs with water and cause a drowning factor. And so it's always really important, especially at a pool or at the lake or by the water, that there's always one person responsible for keeping an eye on the children. By law, it is important and it is now necessary and mandatory that children are in the appropriate car seat when they're in a vehicle. Regardless if you pay $70 for a car seat or you spend $400 for a car seat, that's not what's going to keep your child safe. What's gonna keep your child safe is that it was installed properly and that you're using it properly. With the Louisiana Passenger Safety Task Force, we have over 400 safety technicians across the state that are willing to help you install your seat for free. And we do that because we want kids to be safe on the roads and the highways. And hey, welcome back. Joining me to discuss how to keep children safe in the car and elsewhere is our panel. In the studio is Jamar Melton, a pediatrician with the Baton Rouge Clinic and clinical instructor for our Lady of the Lakes Pediatric Residency Program. And joining us remotely is Alisa Stevens. She is the Community Programs Manager for the Southwest Louisiana Center for Health Services and a former Safe Kids Coordinator. She's coming to us from Lake Charles. And just a reminder, during this broadcast, we're conducting an interactive survey. Please text HEALTH to 415-223-8013 or visit lpb.org slash children's health to take part. We'd love to get your feedback. Uh, Ms. Stevens, uh, first question to you. Um, what do new mothers need to know when putting a newborn to sleep? Well, first of all, it's like to say thank you for having me. Um, and there's a lot of information that new mothers need to have. I know that there's a lot that they need to try to pay attention to and have concerns with, but safe sleep is really one that needs to be at the top of their list. So as we saw earlier, accidental suffocation is one of the leading causes of death, not only here in Region 5 where I live at in Lake Charles, but also across the state of Louisiana. So you want to make sure that you are not co-sleeping. You wanna make sure that you share the room and not the bed. Sleeping with your child can increase the risk of suffocation by 40 times, mm. okay? You wanna make sure that you offer your child a clean, dry pacifier before going to sleep. Now, if they don't want it, don't force it. But what the pacifier does is keep them keep their brains aroused, okay? So they're easily aroused while sucking the pacifier. They always have a need to suck. They're not in that deep of a sleep and it makes the arousal process easier. Um, you wanna make sure that you keep the room cool as well. Babies' bodies overheat seven to 10 times faster than ours do. They don't regulate heat the way we do. So overheating is a risk factor for SIDS. You also want to make sure that your healthy baby is always on their back. Healthy sure. babies sleep on their back. Very good. Thank you so much for that. So let me ask you, which, which infants are at greater risk of sudden infant death syndrome? Those infants that are at greater risk are your low birth weight babies, you, your babies that are premature. Also, if mom smoked while pregnant, that increases the risk for SIDS for two to five times. If babies are exposed to secondhand smoke, that increases their risk by three times. 
Interesting, Dr. Melton, uh, drownings make up a third of accidental deaths in Louisiana's children. Um, what are some of the precautions that parents can take to prevent these types of drownings? Well, you know, Marvin, we live in a state where water is an integral part of our lives. We live on the water, we work on the water, and we play on the water. Mm -hmm. And because it is, is there's so much water involved in our lives, we need to protect our children against drowning. Uh, most people don't know this, but uh, uh, accidental drowning is the number one cause of death in children between the ages of one and four. And so in a state where we have so much access to water, uh, there are a few things that have statistically been shown to improve and prevent drowning in children. The most important thing is that most children between the ages of one and four who drown do so in a private pool. One thing we can do in private pools is make sure that our pools are surrounded by a fence with a separate gate that latches from the inside and we make certain that all pools have this this safety uh, feature it's also been shown that children who take swimming lessons uh, reduce their risk of drowning in one study uh, it approximately reduced drowning by about 85 percent in children who had received swimming lessons and so it's important and the american academy of pediatrics recommends that children over the age of one receive um, uh, swimming lessons to uh, attempt to prevent the risk of drowning and lastly we we should never leave children unattended in a pool and one of the things to remember is that you want to keep them at arm's length so it doesn't take long for a child to drown so if you're in a public pool or you're uh, at your pool you need to keep your child and, and your toddler at arm's length um, and those things do um, have been statistically shown to improve um, and reduce the risk of drowning in our children well, there are a lot of gun owners in Louisiana. What are some basic tips that you can give parents if you have guns in a home? Yeah, so in the state of Louisiana, we do live in a, in, 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 in a um, culture that is very, um, uh, you know, hunting and gun ownership is very important. I think two thirds of Louisiana uh, uh, citizens own guns. And, you know, if we're going to own guns, we need to take the responsibility of, of gun ownership to protect our children. The most important thing we can do is store our guns safely. Um, guns should be stored in a locked gun cabinet with locked trigger locks, and ammunition should be stored in a separate um, uh, area and also under lock and key. The most important thing is to remember though that those at risk, your children, your adolescents who live in your houses, don't they don't need to know where the keys to the gun safes are. You know, you need to keep that in a, in, a, in a separate area that only you know where they are. So this limits access that children have to guns. What do you what do parents tell a child if they see a gun in someone else's home? So I think it's very very simple. Um, they're very basically three things we tell kids, and and what you need to do as a parent is make sure you're role playing. You know the, these scenarios. Basically, it's stop, don't touch, run away, and get an adult. And those three things need to be you need to bring up to your children constantly, all the time. The other thing that's very helpful in these situations is role playing. You know, with all safety uh, when it comes to children, role playing with your children can help a lot. And so talk to your children and, and play, you know, say what, you know, lay a, lay a toy gun out and, mm -hmm. and walk in and say, you know, what would you do if you if this you know came into a friend's house and, and walk them through those role plays. The other thing is is make sure when your child is going out that that if they're going to a house ask do you have guns in your house and if they do make sure your child knows how what to do if they come across a gun very good miss stevens uh louisiana's uh child seat legislation has been applauded for being the best in the nation what are some of the rules of the road for traveling with infants and young children so you want to make sure that your child that is under the age of two rides rear facing. So in Louisiana, all children under the age of two must ride rear facing. You move to a forward facing seat when your child has outgrown that rear facing seat by height and weight and is at least two years old. Now that forward facing seat also has a have to have a five point harness. And what I mean by a five point harness is that, that the harness, the internal harness of the car seat is gonna hit at five points, which is one, two, the shoulder, three is the crotch, and four or five, both hips. Your child can move to a booster seat from a forward-facing seat when they're at least four years old and has, has outgrown that forward-facing seat by height or weight. 
Now, that booster seat must be installed with a lap and a shoulder belt. It is against the law in Louisiana to ride in a booster seat without a lap and shoulder belt. There's no upper body protection for the child. They can sit in a seat belt when they can pass the five point test. That means your child can sit all the way back. The shoulder belt comes ac across the chest, not the neck, fits across your lap belt, the lap portion, and um, the child is not sliding down. The feet doesn't hit the back of the seat. Their, bends, their knees bend comfortably over the seat and the uh, lap belt is not coming across the abdomen. So Ms. Stevens, uh, get, getting back to the seat, how can you determine if uh, your child's seat is installed correctly? Well, the best way to determine if your child's seat is installed correctly is to make an appointment with a certified technician to check your seat out. And as you heard earlier, we have several hundred technicians across Louisiana that can help. But if your seat is rear facing, if your child's seat is rear facing, it has to be at a 30 to 45 degree angle. The harness straps should be at or below the shoulder, as close to the shoulder as possible. And that retainer clip or that plastic clip should be at the shoulder uh, armpit level. Is there an, on, an online uh, resource that parents can go to to get more information about uh, uh, car seat installations? Yes, you can go to Safe Kids, uh, Worldwide Safe Kids. You can also go to the uh, Buckle Up Louisiana Facebook page, and there's lots of information there. Thanks to Ms. Stevens and Dr. Melton for that helpful information about keeping children safe. According to data from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, several of Louisiana's parishes lack psychologists or psychiatrists, and that's a challenge for our state, which is not only dealing with a pandemic, but has endured five major storms this hurricane season. Here's Teresa Falgu again with what the Kids Count data tells us about Louisiana children's mental health. One of the Kids Count indicators on children's mental health looks at the number of children ages three to 17 who have a parent that reported that a doctor has told them that their child has autism, developmental delays, depression, anxiety, ADHD, or behavioral conduct problems. And unfortunately, that data shows that we actually tied for the highest rate in the entire country with West Virginia. And we're actually seven percentage points above the national average. One of the things that we've seen with COVID-19, the data definitely shows that we should be very concerned about children's mental health and families' economic well-being. It confirms, of course, what we all had suspected, which was that Louisiana kids were vulnerable before all of this started, and that makes them much more vulnerable now with COVID-19. When we looked at the data, we found that almost one out of every four adults with children in their home has little to no confidence in their ability to pay rent or mortgage um, on time next month. And 28% of children with adults in their homes in Louisiana said that they had felt down, depressed, or hopeless for more than half of the days or nearly every day for the previous week. And the reason that's important is we know that children's mental health is really inextricably linked to adults' mental health, particularly for the youngest children who are really dependent on parents for kind of overall well-being and care in a way that older kids aren't. And welcome back. Joining me in the studio to discuss the mental health challenges of Louisiana's families is Dr. Anna Long, a licensed psychologist with dual focus in child clinical and school psychology who teaches at LSU. And Gigi Dunn, an MD and a physician educator who teaches integrative medicine. Dr. Dunn, uh, children in Louisiana have had to deal with a pandemic and several hurricanes. Uh, what are some of the stress responses that we can expect from children in these situations? Oh my goodness, we have all been through so much in 2020 um, between the pandemic and then everything has been exacerbated by the environmental trauma that we've all experienced. Our children are having a huge impact from all of this. If we begin by talking very simply about the definition of stress, stress is increased demand and decreased control. If we look at what the children have had to navigate in this last year, the demands on them have been enormous. 
enormous. Children already don't have a lot of control and they have had even less during this most recent time. Let's look a little bit at what happens with the bodies of children and adults as well in the stress response. Our bodies respond in our nervous system and our endocrine or hormonal system to stress. The side of the nervous system that is our stress response is the sympathetic nervous system. And this does a response called fight or flight. And in our bodies, it's exactly as it sounds. It increases heart rate, increases blood pressure. It can make our breathing very shallow and very rapid. It can impact digestion. Children feel all of this in their bodies, but sometimes they don't have words to tell us what they're feeling. They may act this out. So you may they see changes in their behavior like crying, anger, temper tantrums. They may end up having difficulty sleeping or nightmares. You may see them acting as though their little bodies are running all the time. They may be having hyperactivity or hypervigilance. All of this can be a very normal stress response to what's going on in the environment. Children are also like little sponges. They can take in the stress of the family. And so if the parents aren't also dealing with their stress responses, the children may be acting that out as well. Dr. Long, what could, uh, what could be considered some extreme reactions that could lead to professional intervention? Yeah, so I think it's first important for, for parents and families to think about what would cause like an extreme stress response or what we call a traumatic stress response. And so those are any kind of events that make a child feel a loss of like safety or security in their lives, anything that they experience as extremely negative or uncontrollable. So you can imagine all of these things that we have been through recently really do constitute what we call crisis events that can produce this sort of traumatic or extreme um, stress reaction. And so um, now that you kind of have an understanding of what can cause that, um, the important thing to know is that most children will not have an extreme stress reaction. So recovery is really the norm and resilience is really the norm. And kids do very well with adapting, especially if their their caregivers are managing their own stress and, and paying attention to their kids and giving them support and assistance to adapt. Um, but the things that let you know that you need to seek help for your child are sort of two things. One would be some of these sort of more minor changes in their behavior or functioning per, stay um, prolonged over time, mm -hmm. so over weeks. So they used to go to sleep really easily and now it's been two, three weeks and we just cannot get them to go to sleep, stay asleep, stay in their bed, or um, they used to be potty trained and now they're having accidents all the time and that's not going back to normal. So any kind of changes that you see that are more mild, you know, like in their thinking or their concentration or their learning or in their ability to regulate their emotions or, or in their behavior, if those stick around for a while, mm -hmm. then you should be getting assistance. Um, because if you leave them, then they can actually get worse um, or they can stick around for much longer than you want them to do, want them to, and they can create other um, challenges in their well being and functioning. Um, the other thing would be if you see what we call a more serious or traumatic stress response, and you'll notice this if your child has really intense emotions. So intense fear, sadness, agitation or irritability, uh, mood swings, if they have a hard time um, experiencing positive emotions, enjoying things they used to, um, they start to socially withdraw from others or they just can't get along with other people um, or they're kind of more disorganized or um, kind of dysregulated. So any of those more kind of intense things, those you should seek help for right, right away. Very good. Uh, Dr. Dunn, what are some uh, stress reduction tools that pregnant mothers can use and, and what may their uh, 
impact be on child development? Well, we know an awfully lot these days with strong research on what happens when the baby is still in the mother's body. We know about something that's called fetal origin of adult disease. And what happens is, in a way, it's a very wise thing that nature does. When a mother is in stressful or traumatic circumstances during her pregnancy, her stress hormones are higher based on what we've previously discussed. The baby is bathed in these stress hormones, and so as a result, nature is getting the baby ready to have the stress response that it can for the stressful environment that it's coming into. The downside to that, though, sometimes shows up a good bit later. As a result of this, the baby can be set up for something metabolically called metabolic syndrome in decades to come. Because there's a higher set level of the stress hormones like cortisol, then what can end up happening is this impacts the baby's brain and can impact memory and learning. The other thing that can happen because of this higher stress hormone set point is the baby can take a longer time in adulthood to respond to stressors and this can underlie maybe even lifelong anxiety that's not explained. The good news is nature also gives us the parasympathetic nervous system which does rest and digest. So we can do very inexpensive tools multiple times throughout the day. The mother can employ these during her pregnancy. She can share them with the other members of her family. Things like as simple as turning to her breath and making it slower, deeper, quieter, and more regular. The other things that can be done are free meditation apps. One of my absolute favorites is nature. Time in nature is almost like a Valium pill in a way. It completely melts away stress and it doesn't have to be for long. Dr. Long, uh, new moms and dads can often face the stress of crying babies or temper tantrums. So what are some of the things that they can do to kind of cope with this? Yeah, so um, I think we all know that parenting is stressful and um, you know parents don't only have parenting stress, they have stress from many other sources. So it's really kind of thinking about how stress works and um, understanding that for every new demand or pressure that's placed on a parent, um, you need to up your personal and external uh, coping resources. So stress becomes unhealthy for parents when their um, pressures and demands of parenting in life kind of exceed what they have to cope with them. And then they can start to feel really overwhelmed um, and burnt out and incapable. Uh, so some easy ways for parents to kind of take care of their stress is certainly, you know, just healthy habits in terms of taking care of yourself um, with eating, proper sleep as much as you can. Sometimes that's very difficult for new parents. Um, you know, taking a break, even if it's just taking a few extra moments in a locked bathroom before you step back out mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to, you know, handle the troops, removing yourself from screens, you know, sure. kind of unplugging because all of the different stressors from the world, the more of them that you take in and listen to and read on social media, that's just upping uh, your stress level for your, your body to manage. Um, and then I think another really important thing is just being kind to yourself as a parent. Um, you don't need to be a perfect parent and in fact, your children will probably benefit from your imperfections because they will learn life skills like how to be patient, how to resolve conflict, how to deal with other people's emotions. So um, I think not worrying about you know being perfect in every moment and just thinking more about the long game and having that consistency over time um, because really all your child needs is that unconditional love, um, that time, their needs to be met, and then that structure and predictability to, to help them you know, um, grow and thrive. Um, ask for help, mm -hmm. accept help <laughs> is super important. You can take things off of your plate you know, dust bunnies can collect, dishes can pile a little bit, and you shouldn't, you know, feel guilty about it. Um, and then just reaching out and connecting with other parents is really helpful. 
their kids can entertain your kids and you can also vent. So that's a, a great way to kind of reduce some of your stress. So, so, so briefly, what can young children be taught about dealing with stress? Yeah, so I think when we're helping kids with stress, there's two ways that we do it. One is like a preventative way. So thinking about how we can build resilience um, and the ability to handle stress. So for kids that's having uh, consistency with rules in your home and routine so that they have that structure and predictability that give them that sort of sense of security or a home base. Um, it's also helping them to understand emotional awareness and self-regulation. Mm -hmm. So being able to label their emotions, um, describe what's going on in their body when they feel them, recognize the behaviors that follow when you feel happy versus when you feel sad versus when you feel angry, knowing the different intensity so that they know when they need to step in and kind of use some strategies to help regulate their emotions. And then just giving them some simple tools, you know, that you can model, whether it's taking a break or, you know, taking a breath or talking to somebody or reaching out for help or thinking about ways that they can make a situation better or how they can make themselves feel better. Um, so those are just kind of some simple ways to, to help kids with their stress. Well, very good. I want to thank you very much for that. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time for our discussion tonight. I want to thank Drs. Long and Dunn and all of our participants for their input. We encourage you to comment on tonight's show by visiting lpb.org slash public square and clicking on the Join the Conversation link. And please take our interactive survey on the issues we've covered by texting HEALTH to 415-223-8013 or visiting lpb.org slash children's health and look for the launch of LPB's One to Grow On series in January. Thanks for watching tonight, good evening. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org.